Good morning. I'm Professor Verstraten from Belgium. I live in Bruch, which is also a Hansa city like Kaliningrad here. So I will speak about bone tumors in this lecture. And we will focus on the types of bone tumors, indications for MR imaging, differential diagnosis, and imaging strategies. When you see a bone tumor on an X-ray, you should try to find the type of matrix. Is it bone? Is it cartilage? Is it fibrous matrix? Is it fat? Or is it something else? And then you should try to make a differential diagnosis. Is it a tumor? tumor lesion, or is it normal? So now you should work. What is this? And do you need MRI? You get three seconds. Next, what is it? And do you need MRI? What is the matrix? Is it bone? Is it cartilage? Is it fibrous tissue? Is it fatty tissue? Or is it something else? Another three seconds for the next matrix. What do you think? And do you need MRI? This one is more difficult. See an arm, and there is a lytic lesion. Looks like a flame of a fire. What is it? What is the matrix? So now we go to the solutions. These were all bone forming tumors. You have seen the white spots that are bone islands, and ostoma. It's an incidental finding. Don't touch, and don't do MRI. The second tumor we have seen was in the head, and it is an osteoma. An osteoma, you can see here. It is a bone-forming tumor, very compact bone. It's white, it's a typical image. You often find it in the frontal sinus. And you just need CT if there is complications. The other one, you often will miss the lesion when it's in the vertebra on an X-ray because it's hidden. It's the osteoma. You don't need MRI, uh, CT is better to find the nidus. And the last one was Paget's disease. But in the first phase of Paget's disease, you have osteoporosis circumscripta, which means it starts with osteoporosis. And later on, it becomes more white with more calcifications. So this, you make the diagnosis on X-ray. We go on. It's early in the morning, but still you should work. What do you think of this patient? It's the same patient, but there are a few years between the two images. Is it bone? Is it cartilage? Is it fibrous tissue? Is it fat? Or is it something else? Another one, 15 years old, knee pain. You see the right knee and the left knee. And there is something wrong in this area. It is white on x-ray. And the lesion leaves the bone outside the bone. It's an osteosarcoma. 
an osteosarcoma, you don't do a uh, CT scan. You should do MRI in every malignant bone tumor. So the bone forming tumors which need MRI are osteoblastoma, which is a giant osteoid osteoma. Osteosarcoma, you always need MRI. And osteochondroma, you just need MRI to see the cartilaginous cap. We will focus on that. Here we have an example of another type of tumor. You see tibia. And when you look at the cortex, have a look here, this one, you see the cortex going further, like this, and you see the bone going into the lesion. You can also see that on MRI, but on T2 images, you will see white cap, and the white cap is cartilage, so it's osteocartilaginous exostosis. Next question, what is this type of tumor? You see on the X-ray cartilage forming tumor here. This is another patient and you have a lytic lesion here. It's st still a child, he's not an adult and the lesion is located in the epiphysis. This is more difficult. A lesion in the femur, which is sharply delineated, but breaks down the cortex and goes a little bit into the soft tissues. So this is rather atypical. You would maybe think of a benign lesion, but be careful. And another patient with a pelvis. Um, I think you can see this one. But if you look carefully, you will see many other lesions. And they are also... So the more you look, the more lesions you will see. So these were all cartilage-forming tumors. Um, if you have a lytic lesion in an epiphysis in a child, then it is a chondroblastoma. You need MRI for this tumor. Then we had a enchondroma, and in enchondroma you need MRI for differential diagnosis with chondrosarcoma. Then um, we had here a difficult one. It's not frequent, but a um, chondromyxoite fibroma looks like a non-ossifying fibroma, but it breaks through the cortex, so be careful. Chondrosarcoma, you need MRI, and osteochondroma, you need MRI to see the thickness of the cartilaginous cap. If it is more than 2.5, centimeters thick, it's probably a chondrosarcoma. So that's why you need MRI. So how can you recognize cartilage on, um, uh, on X-ray? You all know it is fine stippled, popcorn-like arcs and rings. Uh, here you can see rings and arcs and this is more popcorn-like. So these tumors occur in a lot of lesions and you can read the names here. Then you have the question, which one is a osteocartilaginous exostosis and which one is malignant? On the X-ray, you cannot know. So you need MRI to see the thickness of the cartilaginous cap. So here we have a T1-weighted image 
and you see here the osseous part of the lesion, here also osseous part. And when we look on T2 uh, images, so we have here T1 and we have T2, you should look at the lesion and here we see a thick cartilaginous cap which is more than 2.5 centimeter. So this part of the tumor is malignant. When we look at this part of the tumor, you see the bony component and there is no white cap. So this is exostosis, this is not malignant. Next uh, case, any idea what this is? It's a femur and when I was outside, I couldn't see very good this building. This is like smoke. So it's a smoky appearance or ground glass appearance. And we know this in fibrous dysplasia. Um, for this one here, where is my pointer? This one is um, fibrous dysplasia and you don't need MRI. And for non-ossifying fibroma, you don't need CT, you don't need MRI. It's just stop, don't touch lesion. This is the malignant part, which is a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. It's an aggressive tumor. It breaks through the cortex and uh, it behaves a little bit like an osteosarcoma. So you need MRI. But sometimes it's difficult in um, MRI. Here we have a lesion um, in the skull base. And I don't know what it is on MRI. So in some cases you need CT scan. And then you see this is typical of a fibrous dysplasia. Because you cannot see the bony matrix. CT is better than MRI for that. It's another example here. Fibrous dysplasia with ground glass appearance. You cannot see it very well on MRI. You need CT scan. So we have seen bone tumors with cartilaginous tumors and fibrous tumors. Now we go to all the rest. And that's a lot of tumors. So this one is a lytic lesion um, in the calcaneus. And on T1, it's white. So when it's white on T1, you know it's an intraosseous lipoma. If it would be dark on T1 and white on T2, it would be a cyst. Another type is the solitary bone cyst, where you have a lytic lesion. You don't need CT for that, you do MRI, and when you do MRI, it's white on T2, dark on T1, and when you give gadolinium, you see enhancement of the wall, so this is a solitary bone cyst. Another type of tumor, which is also lytic and expansile, it takes space. When you look at T2 and you see fluid-fluid levels, you can say, this is an aneurysmal bone cyst. There is a few exceptions. You have teleangiectatic osteosarcoma, but this is very rare. In this type of tumor, which is a hemangioma, you see thickened trabeculi, like the wheel of a bicycle. In fact, you can make the diagnosis on X-ray, but you need MRI to see complications in the brain. When you have an adult with a lytic lesion in an epiphysis or metaphysis, you have a giant cell tumor of bone. And I will talk later on dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. When you do this, you will see this type of tumor has a very fast uh, wash in followed by early wash out. 
And then we have Ewing sarcoma, which is a permeative lesion. Uh, you can hardly see it, but you see a little bit of periosteal reaction. This is mud eaten um, bone uh, osteolysis. And on MRI, you will see the tumor, which often has a large and thick soft tissue component. So this is typical for Ewing sarcoma. When you have a child with a lytic lesion in a bone, for instance in the pelvis, and you do MRI T1 and T2, there is only one lesion which is higher signal intensity than muscle. So you see this is bright compared to muscle. Then you have the diagnosis of eosinophilic granuloma. Other types of tumor will be lower than muscle tissue. So this is the clue to make the diagnosis of eosinophilic granuloma. Difficult tumor, which is osteofibrous dysplasia and adamantinoma. Um, osteofibrous dysplasia is benign and adamantinoma is malignant. They look the same. It's a lytic lesion, most frequently in the tibia, anterior cortex. Uh, so you should do MRI to see where is the lesion. And if it breaks through the cortex, it's probably the malignant adamantinoma. Very rare tumor is chordoma. Chordoma arises from the nucleus pulposus of the disc and it often occurs um, in the cervical spine but also in the sacrum. And it's a tumor which has a uh, intermediate signal intensity of chordomatous tissue and it's aggressive and breaks through the cortex. So all these special types of tumor they need MRI to better stage the tumor and to try to find the matrix of the tumor. So you can read this, why we need MRI in all these special types of tumor. So we have seen the types of bone tumors. We have seen why we need MRI, sometimes CT scan differential diagnosis and now we will look how to make images of these bone tumors. So often you will need biopsy and then your colleague will ask you how shall I go to the tumor? Which way to go? Well you should suggest a way so that unaffected compartments are not contaminated. So it's not always the shortest route, but the safest route. And there are many articles, and this is a very good article, which shows compartmental anatomy, um, so that you go through only one compartment to the tumor. This is important. First, MRI, then biopsy, not the other way. And why should we do that? Oh, this you can show to your colleagues. Always first MRI and then the biopsy. We want to have first MRI because we want to see which part of the tumor is the most representative. We want to show the best way to go to the tumor and if the biopsy is done before MRI, there is always blood and edema, and you will have difficulties to make the diagnosis and to give a name to the tumor. How should you do the staging of a bone tumor? What type of sequence do you need? First of all, say to your technicians that you need a extended view of the whole bone. So you need longitudinal T1 weighted sequence from one joint to the other one. For instance, this patient has a malignant bone tumor here. 
you need to see the whole femur to detect this skip metastasis. Maybe you would amputate here and patient would die from this skip metastasis. And only afterwards you do a local coil. This is another tumor. This patient we have seen the x-ray. That was the patient with the osteosarcoma and he has a skip metastasis here. So first body coil and then local coil. If we want to see bone marrow invasion, um, we will use T1 weighted images. If you want to see soft tissue extension, we use T2 and we will use gadolinium. So to see soft tissue extent, delineation from muscle, the best sequences are T1 with gadolinium, fat suppressed T2, fat suppressed proton density, and T1 after gadolinium. You cannot see the infiltration very well on T1, so they are not optimal. If you want to see the bone marrow invasion, T1 is very good. You can see the margin of the tumor. Um, on fat suppressed images, you can also very, see, very well see the bone marrow invasion. What we do is always longitudinal T1, transverse or axial T1, T1 plus gadolinium, fat suppressed proton density and T2. And after gadolinium, we do the longitudinal image and we also repeat the axial image, uh, often with fat saturation. Why do we use gadolinium and what can we do with gadolinium? So you need gadolinium to see the difference uh, between, um, here you, you see only tumor, but what is viable tumor and what is not viable. So the areas which do enhance are active bone tumor components and you should do the biopsy in the active component and not in this necrosis or cartilaginous part of the tumor. We will also use uh, gadolinium for monitoring chemotherapy and to detect recurrence. This is a very interesting technique which you should use always in bone tumors and also in soft tissue tumors. It is dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. I will show how it works. So you have the gadolinium here, you inject it and then you put saline solution after it, uh, injection speed, and it allows you when you make fast images to see vascularization of the tumor, perfusion, capillary permeability and interstitial space. I give an example. This is a patient with a osteosarcoma. You select an imaging slice and this is the slice we have. And you measure every second during the first two to three minutes. And then you design a region of interest, for instance, the muscle, and you see there is a slow enhancement in the muscle. And when we look in the tumor, you see a very fast washing and it continues afterwards. But what does it mean? Well, what happens when gadolinium comes into the tumor, it will go through the capillaries into the tissues. And this area here, what you see in the first pass, reflects the number of capillaries. It reflects blood velocity. Is it going slow or fast? and it shows you capillary permeability. So in malignant tissues, you will have a fast enhancement. The second part of the curve, which is uh, this one here, this reflects the volume of the interstitial space. So if you have a large interstitial space, it will still continue to enhance. If you have many cells and a small interstitial space, you will have a plateau and you will even have wash out. 
it also shows you the water pressure in the tissue. So when you have a patient with a osteosarcoma or another malignant tumor, a Ewing sarcoma for instance, on day one, you select an imaging plane, this here, you make the dynamic study and you calculate the region of interest in the muscle and you make also a region of interest in the tumor. And this is when you, what you start with at day one. Then your patient receives three months of chemotherapy and you have to say if he is a good responder or a bad responder. So what we see after three months in the same patient, you don't know on conventional MRI if this is good response or bad response. So when we do dynamic MRI, you see that this curve is slow and this is the sign of a good response. When you have this type of curve with early washing, short plateau and wash out, this is seen in these four types of tumor. We find it in giant cell tumor, Ewing sarcoma, multiple myeloma and hypervascular metastasis. So you can also use this in the spine for instance. This is an example of a giant cell tumor which has a very fast wash in, a very short plateau phase and wash out. And this is because you have many, many cells, very, very small interstitial space. Now let's look at a special tumor which is a combination of a giant cell tumor with aneurysmal bone cyst. So it's a combined combination tumor. Um, when we look here, we have this area, oh, excuse me, this area here, which is not enhancing, and this is the slow component of the aneurysmal bone cyst in the tumor. The other area is very fast enhancing with plateau and wash out, and this is the giant cell tumor component of the tumor. This patient had surgery, they put in bone chips, they took away the tumor, and then you get this image and they ask you, is this bone chips who are very well grown in, or is this a recurrence? And you don't know on classic MRI, you need dynamic MRI, and when we look at this patient on dynamic MRI, this area is a recurrent tumor. The second area is also recurrence. This is granulation tissue and bone chips, which are incorporated. And you always compare with muscle tissue. This is another uh, tumor. The patient had a Ewing sarcoma. They have done surgery and we find a white spot after surgery. So we do dynamic MRI and we have in this suspect area slow enhancement and this is reactive tissue. This is not recurrent Ewing sarcoma. So with dynamic MRI you know what it is. If you want to know more and read more you can uh, read this book, Imaging of Bone Tumors and Tumor-like Lesions. So I thank you for your attention.